the advantage that light-skinned people have with white people is that if white people actually look at them, they can see themselves. But Jack Johnson was a big, black, dark-skinned man. See, extremely dark-skinned black guys in particular, everybody is put out by them. Because when they come on the scene, everybody tends to feel they're in the presence of something aboriginal. But somebody like Jack Johnson, everybody's like, oh, now we're back at the beginning. And so I think that Johnson had that kind of power, too. They must have enjoyed it. They must have enjoyed being scared. We all go to see a horror movie because we like being scared. It's a part of human nature, you know. Give me a scary booger booger bear and I'm going to be happy. And it wasn't just white people. The decent black folk didn't want their daughters associated with him. So he couldn't have a date with them. <laughs> So-called so decent black girl, whatever that meant. But um, the black people were so-called um, middle class black people were scared of him, terrified of him, as much as white people were. Advice to Jack Johnson. Mr. Jack Johnson must conduct himself in a modest manner. He can hurt the race immeasurably just now if he goes splurging and making a useless, noisy exhibition of himself. We hope that he will not be arrested on any charge. Any undue exhibition on the part of Mr. Johnson will hurt every member of the race. On the other hand, becoming modesty and self-control will win him many friends. The New York Age. Modesty was never part of Jack Johnson's makeup. Neither was self-control. Everywhere the champion went, trouble now seemed to follow. Some of it stirred up by his enemies. Some of his own making. And certain unfair persons, piqued because I was champion, decided if they could not get me one way, they would another. Two years earlier, a new federal law had gone into effect. The Mann Act was named for its sponsor, Illinois Republican Congressman James Robert Mann. It barred the transportation of women in interstate or foreign commerce for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. A landmark of progressive era legislation, the Mann Act was intended to stop the luring of young women into prostitution, what was called the white slave traffic, not private relationships between consenting adults. but officials of the Justice Department saw in it their chance to destroy Jack Johnson. By October of 1912, Johnson had a new companion, a 19-year-old prostitute from Milwaukee named Lucille Cameron. When her mother, Mrs. F. Cameron Falconet, came to Chicago and went to the police, charging Johnson with abducting her daughter, the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation agreed to take the case. Jack Johnson has hypnotic powers, Mrs. Cameron Falconet assured the press, and he has exercised them on my little girl. I would rather see my daughter spend the rest of her life in an insane asylum than see her the plaything of a nigger. Her lawyer said that by having a relationship with his client's daughter, Jack Johnson had insulted every white woman in the United States the Mann Act. It was never aimed at an individual having a liaison with a secretary going from New York to Hoboken. It was aimed at commercialized vice. And the Attorney General of America, a man by the name of Wickersham, knew this. And when he was first approached with, with to use this against Jack Johnson, he understood that we, we can't do this, that this, this is a travesty. But eventually, Wickersham was convinced to go after Jack Johnson to pervert the law. 
On October 18, 1912, Chicago police arrested Johnson for violating the Mann Act. The United States versus Jack Johnson decided to attack him on the basis of the sex life and the miscegenation. Miscegenation has always been uh, a preoccupation and a fixation in the, in, in, the, in the mind of white America. Black men with white women, this had always been a concern. I think that it was exactly what the South did after it lost the Civil War. It lost the shooting war, but eventually it won the policy war and was able to keep the Constitution from functioning below the Mason-Dixon line. So this is a variation on the way that the South won after it lost. That's exactly what happened with Jack Johnson. We can't find anybody to beat him, so we'll just do what we've done before which is just turning the law against him. Johnson was released on $800 bail by nightfall. Lucille Cameron was locked up too. And when Johnson went to the bank to get $25,000 with which to try to bail her out, an angry mob gathered outside. There were shouts of lynch him and Johnson had to take refuge inside his own cafe. A few days later, the city collector padlocked the Café de Champion and canceled its license, declaring Johnson an undesirable person and of bad character. So long as I do not interfere with any other man's wife, I shall claim the right to select the woman of my own choice. Nobody else can do that for me. I am not a slave, and I have the right to choose who my mate shall be without the dictation of any man. I have eyes, and I have a heart, and when they fail to tell me who I shall have as mine, I want to be put in a lunatic asylum. And now, as Johnson had always feared, some African Americans began to abandon him. October 26th, 1912. It is unfortunate that a man with money should use it in a way to injure his own people in the eyes of those who are seeking to uplift his race and improve its conditions. I wish to say emphatically that Jack Johnson's actions did not meet my personal approval and I am sure that they do not meet with the approval of the colored race. A man with muscle minus brains is a useless creature. Booker T. Washington. I think there are three black leaders in the first couple decades of the 20th century. One is Booker T. Washington, who has a message saying, hunker down, get education, work hard, save your money, be reliable, don't worry about social justice necessarily or social advancement. On the other hand, you have W.E.B. Du Bois, who stands for, we want social equality, we want economic equality, we want advancement on all levels. And then there's Jack Johnson that says, I'm getting mine, but he stands for pure individualism, egoism. I do not look upon Jack Johnson as a race leader, nor do I in any way endorse his life and mannerisms, for it will not pay anyone to follow it. But the whole world is upon him today. Behind it all, you can see a large degree of race prejudice. He got mixed up with white women. Way down in his heart, he has a craving for Miss Anne. And that does not lay well on the stomach of the white man. Hence, he has been arrested and his case thrown on the canvas, so to speak. And the whole world throws up its hands and cries, behold the brute, let us crucify him. Baltimore, Afro-American. 
Miss Cameron denies that she has been intimate with Jack Johnson or any other person. Her appearance, however, belies that statement. As she dresses in the height of fashion, wearing a hat said to have cost $150. Agent M.J. Linz, Bureau of Investigation. Despite her mother's charges, Lucille Cameron refused to cooperate with the prosecutors. Called before the grand jury, she said she loved and wished to marry Johnson. Then she collapsed in tears. Without her help, there was no case. But that did not stop either the state or the federal government. They were determined to get Jack Johnson one way or another. The white public now demanded it. Assistant District Attorney Harry A. Parkin called upon the Bureau of Investigation of the United States Department of Justice to help build a new case by sending its agents out to secure evidence as to illegal transportation by Johnson of any woman for immoral purposes. Federal agents fanned out across the country, looking into anonymous tips, interviewing prostitutes, chauffeurs, waiters, bellhops, pullman porters, ex-managers, former sparring partners, fishing for something, anything that might be used to suggest that the champion had defied federal law. October 31st, 1912. I, Bell Schreiber, alias Bell Gilbert, alias Bell Leslie, alias Mrs. J.A. Gilbert, alias Leslie Allen, alias Mrs. Jack Johnson. First being duly sworn to pose and say. My enemies had never ceased their activities. When they could find nothing involving me improperly with Miss Cameron, they hit on an old trail. And learning of my association with Belle Schreiber, hunted her down. She was brought from Washington and set up as the accusing witness against me. The government's new chief witness turned out to be Johnson's ex-lover, Belle Schreiber, tracked to a Washington, D.C. whorehouse, then placed under protective custody by the Bureau of Investigation and threatened with imprisonment if she did not cooperate. Embittered by Johnson's treatment of her, perhaps envious of Lucille Cameron for having displaced her in his affections, Schreiber would be a devastating witness against the man who had been her patron and on and off companion for four years. Her memory for dates and places seemed encyclopedic. <laughs> 